me start with a joke. So mathematician, a physicist, and a physician are asked to estimate the height of a building. And the mathematician says, well, I'll compute a few angles, a few distances on the ground. I know trigonometry. I know the formula. I can do it. The physicist says, I have a barometer. I can measure the air pressure at the bottom, the air pressure at the top. I know the formula. I can compute it. The physician says, from my experience, buildings like that are 40 feet tall. <laughs> now, I'm not here to offend physicians. They're doing God's work. I'm trying to help them with data. And as Thomas has said, I moved to, I tried to use my expertise in large scale data for healthcare. And usually when people think about healthcare, they associate emotion and healing and care and pain and things like that. But if you think about it, in, in great part, healthcare is a pure information business, right? I mean, you go to a physician and you give them some piece of information, the symptoms, maybe lab results, your history, and the doctors take that piece of information and match it to whatever they know about diseases, right? Put it together and they create another piece of information that they plan of care. And they might update it later when more information becomes available. So you take some information and you create more information. That's just an information business. Now there's, of course, other things. There are surgeries and other things that require more than just information, but information is critical there as well. And when you look at how healthcare is using information, I have to say they are much closer to the library card catalog than they are to a Google. And I'll try to figure out why and how and try to suggest some, some ways to improve that. So the first thing I want to do is, is compare the library card catalog to Google. And it might seem ridiculous, right? You're comparing a steam engine to a 747. But it, it has some insights in it. Um, so first thing you might say is, well, Google has enormous computing power, right? No library has ever had anything like that by orders of magnitude. And that's correct. In fact, it's more correct than you think. Uh, when I ran the uh, search at Google, Peter Novig and I did the following calculation. We looked at the total amount of computing that went into the Apollo mission. And I'm not just talking about the flight, the whole four years of the whole program. We just took all the computers they had, figured out they all ran 24 hours a day, added it all up, and what we got is the total amount of computation was within order of magnitude equal to one Google query. So when you go and search Google, you just send a man to the moon, <laughs> computationally wise. Okay, that's how mind-boggling it is, how much computers have improved. So that's definitely a big deal. The other thing that might come to mind is, well, you know, Google has those very, very clever algorithms, clever software. There are those genius engineers sit there and they invent amazing ways to, to search better. And that's true too. But there's a third thing, and that's less known, but I think this is actually the most critical part of why Google and many other web companies manage to do what they do. And that is simply, Google learns from its users. Users are not just consumers of information, they are generators of information. When you went to the card catalog and you looked for something and you didn't find what you were looking for, it made no difference to the card catalog. It was still the same. The next person coming along will have the same problem. When you go to Google and you do any kind of search and you click on some things, Google learns from it. It learns very, very little on any one person, but it does it billions of times a day. And then it uses this data, it learns from this data, and it improves the search daily based on this data. I'll give you a good example. This is an unusual example, but it's a real example, true example. Somebody went to Google a few years ago and searched for the following query, New York Times address. Seems like a pretty obvious query, right? You always worry about the intent of the query, but the intent seems very clear. The person wanted to know the address of the New York Times. And in fact, the first result, Google got it right, the first result had the address of the New York Times. 
So did the second result, and the third result, and the fourth result, and the fifth result. But the sixth result was different. The sixth result, as it turns out, that was the only result the user clicked on. So that was probably the intent. The sixth result was a full transcript of a graduation address given by a prominent New York Times reporter the previous day. You didn't think of that, did you? We didn't think of that either. But somehow, the algorithm figured it out. By that click, the user taught Google some things. It taught Google the importance of diversity of results. It taught Google that the word address has two different meanings. It taught Google the importance of putting recent event in the search result. And again, it taught very, very little. And Google didn't go and change the results for this uh, query such that everybody gets this, uh, this graduation address. It still gave the, the address of the New York Times, because that's what 99.99 whatever percent wanted. But it learned something. Okay? Medicine doesn't do that. And that, that just really, really surprised me when I started looking at it. Uh, in fact, it's more than that. When a Google search engineers, when, when they want to see how to improve a particular query, so they look at the query and they look at the result and they think, well, maybe it's not optimal. Maybe we can improve it. With a click of a button, they can get many, many dozens of screenfuls of data about that particular query and about all the results that are associated with that query. They can find out how many people did it and what happened. And you wouldn't believe the amount of data they can get on any one query that depends on the history of that query. Then they look for patterns, and they look at related queries, and they find some more patterns, and so on. Imagine if doctors had that. Why wouldn't they? When they see anybody with a particular symptoms, a particular condition they're not sure about, they should in a click on a button see the 100,000 other patients just like that, what happened to them, what did they do, what works, what doesn't work. It doesn't mean that they just take the average and then get the, the treatment. They use their intuition. But this, this is doable. Why wouldn't they do this, get the same thing that a Google engineer can do with a click of a button? So I asked that question. And I tried to figure out why is that medicine doesn't look at it. In the high-tech business, in, and I've been in it for, for 20 years almost, patient, user data is the lifeline. It really is absolutely critical. In medicine, this lifeline is not used. Okay. Um, I, I can actually say pretty confidently that Google would have been out of business if they couldn't use the user data. So when I look at medicine, obviously 10, 15 years ago, most of whatever doctors, most of those patient records, they call them patients, not users, uh, most of patient data was written on paper product and was sitting in basement, so you couldn't do anything. But starting about 10 years ago, uh, there was a move to electronic health records. And the government put tens of billions of dollars in incentives for organization to move to electronic health records. Um, and by now, about 80% use it. They are very expensive. They are very complicated. It takes a long time to learn and to use them. And they do two major things. They help with billing, very important. And they help to follow up a user, to, uh, sorry, a patient, to see that they know the history of the patient. So when a doctor looks at the patient, they can see everything that happened to that patient, if everything works right. But one thing they don't do, they don't learn. The one thing that an information business needs more than anything else, they just don't do. They're not designed to learn from the whole system. They're designed to do only one patient at a time. Um, to me, that, that's mind-boggling. That's just inexcusable. This is the most important source of information. And we just let it sit somewhere, and we don't even look at it. So I started trying to get some data from all kinds of sources, and I've done some analysis on it, and I tried to share it with some groups. And I found that everybody said that was very interesting, but they never came back for more data. There was not that much appetite for this. And I kind of wondered, the first comment I always got was the following. They all said, well, you know, this data is noisy, and it's inconsistent, it's dirty, it's unreliable, it, it's not worthy. We can't really work with this data. And I have to say, the first time I heard it, it kind of made me chuckle. Because 
we build a pretty good information service that answers billions of queries a day, most of the time, pretty well. And we're using arbitrary web pages as a source of data. There, there's nothing more unreliable, inconsistent, dirty, noisy than that, right? And we could do this, and we could do this because this is a very large-scale data. And over the years, we learned how to sift through it and find all the jewels. And even if 90% of it is garbage, which is probably true, we still can get all the right things. So the point is you have to learn how to learn from it. And it takes time. It's not easy. I'd like to say that large-scale data heals data wounds. And it's counterintuitive. In the medical field, most experiments are done on small-scale data. 100 people in an experiment is reasonable. A few hundred people is large. More than that is very rare. So by intuition, they develop lots and lots of techniques to deal with very small numbers. The statistics has to be exactly right. Everybody has to be randomized and blind tested and all of that because they deal with small data. When you deal with very large data, it's much easier. You can tolerate errors much, much better. Again, not easy. It doesn't mean that everything just falls into place, but you can develop techniques to do this. You can develop the intuition to do this. You learn how to learn from your data, and that's what's missing. That's what we need to do more of it. Okay? Um, the feeling sort of, and the reason I think that people are not doing much to look at this data, the feeling is sort of, well, you know, garbage in, garbage out. Why should we worry? In my mind, if you know how to learn from it, it's more like garbage in, fertilizer out. But there's more than that. Um, there is the long tail. You might have heard this term used in, in internet context. And it's true. When you deal with large scale information, the long tail rules. People usually intuitively think that everything is 80 20. That if you just look at the top 20 type cases, that covers 80% of the usage. That's not true for large scale information. Probably the opposite is true. Most of the cases are sort of the uncommon cases. And I have a strong suspicion, I'm not a physician, I'm a search guy, but I have a strong suspicion that medicine is like that. I think that's more or less what Eric was talking about as well, that there are so many unusual cases. There are millions of people who suffer from a combination of things, and most of the knowledge is about sort of a standard. They do the experiment only once on one group. Not to mention there are hundreds of, or maybe thousands of, very uncommon diseases some chronic, that millions of people suffer, but there's not enough data about it. Whereas there are, there is data. You can just follow and see those 50,000 people who suffer from that disease and see what happened to them, what worked, what didn't work. We just have to look at this data. Um, and I think that's what's missing. So why is it so hard? There are lots of reasons why people just didn't do it. it. This definitely is hard. But Google was hard too. It didn't just, it took them at least 10 years to get to the point where they actually could learn well and know how to learn from the data. And we need to start doing that. Okay? Uh, there are privacy issues. They are solvable. There are all kinds of problems of those systems not only cannot learn, but they don't interoperate with one another. So there, that's where there is consistency. We can solve that as well. Most of the technical problems can be solved. The problem is sort of getting the wheel and the understanding that this can be done. It's not going to be easy, but it can be done. It needs to be done. Uh, there are thousands of data scientists just within 50 miles of here. And I bet that many, many of them will want nothing less but to start getting access to this data and start building things on it. They would probably be willing to leave aside you know, their work on how to improve by 0.1% some conversion rate of one thing or another, and, and actually get to, to, to better health. But to help them, we need the data. So please, help us get the data. Thank you.